Hello, I'm Richard with ev for You Custom Conversions. And in this episode, we're going to talk about solar, as well as some other ways that you can generate your own power. And with me today is Pete with Advanced Power in Redding, California. And he's going to walk us through uh, solar, uh, grid-type solar systems, standalone solar systems, uh, hydro systems, wind, so forth. They have quite an interesting shop here. They even have their own electric car. So anyway, uh, welcome Pete. And thanks Thank for sharing. Sure. Hello, I'm Pete, and I work here at Advanced Power in Reading. So he mentioned that uh, we have grid tie solar, and we also have standalone. Standalone is also called off grid. That means you don't have any power from a power company. So what I'd like to do is show you the robot we have here, and this is our demonstration thing. So it has all of the components needed to make an off-grid system, solar system. So let's go ahead and start with that. These are two 50-watt solar panels. They take power from the sun, turn it into DC electricity. From there, it follows the wires through and goes down to what's called a charge controller or a solar charge controller. And what that does is take power from the solar panels and puts it down to a battery some type of uh, deep cycle storage battery. And from the deep cycle storage battery, here we're going to go ahead and show you that battery in this system. This is a marine deep cycle battery, and there are many different types of deep cycle batteries. And this is the solar charge controller, this is the inverter. Now on a uh, off-grid system, is there a standard voltage uh, for a system or do they vary? They vary. It depends on the needs of the system. Uh, some smaller systems and also um, systems for RVs or automotive, that kind of thing, they are in the 12 volt range. And to step up, if you were going to have a small cabin or some other kind of off-grid system, you can go to 24 volts. And then the bigger ones would go with 48 volts. And that's all DC battery voltage. And each battery in those kinds of systems is a 6 volt battery. So then we use the um, series and parallel, depending on how many batteries you have, to make whatever voltage we need. Okay, so in other words, if they wanted more standby power based on the demands of their cabin or home, uh, you would parallel more batteries so that they would have a, a greater standby time. Yes. Um, yeah. and so during daylight hours so forth and the, the systems being uh, replenished, but you would base that battery pack size on the demand of that home or yes, situation. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah, the size of the battery bank is sized for uh, the how much load you have that you have to pull out of the batteries um, when the sun isn't shining. So that would be at night or during a storm. So if you have very little demand, you can get away with just a few batteries. And if it only has to go for a day or two, very few batteries. If you're um, running an off uh, house off grid and you have a lot of people living there, you need a lot of batteries. And if you're in an area where there's going to be a lot of storms, you'll need even more batteries to make it through two or three days. Yeah. Now, I, I take it there's also a correlation between that pack size and your solar array. Yes, that's a very important thing. A lot of people don't realize that the battery bank isn't sized on the solar array, and the solar array isn't um, sized for the battery bank. It's all about how much power are you pulling out of the batteries that's your battery bank size, and then how much solar you need is dependent on how quickly you want to charge those batteries back up, and whether or not the load is continuing while you are um, charging from the solar. So let's say you have a small system with four batteries, and you can bring those batteries down to 50% state of charge. If you have a small load demand, and it takes uh, two days, to drain those batteries 50%, but you still have that load going, then you have to know how many um, 
watts of solar panels you need to not only run that load, but recharge those batteries when the clouds go away and you have full sun. So would, would the, uh, the solar array size also be determined, be determined by your location and the amount of sunshine that you get? Absolutely. Say here in Reading where we're tied number two in the nation for the amount of sunshine, mm -hmm. you could probably get away with a smaller array because it's going to be able to charge that whatever size pack you have right. more consistently and, and more rapidly than if you were in Humboldt County uh, yes. where they have fog and uh, you know the Humboldt crud all the time. Right. If you're out on the coast, you have to deal with a lot of fog. If you're in the Midwest, you have to deal with a lot of clouds and, and um, storms that stay around longer. So it's very important. But that, well, I guess what I'm asking, you would need a larger array yes. so that you could recharge those batteries in a shorter period of time? Yes, exactly. Yeah, okay. Yep. yep. Very important. So we, we, we've seen the solar panels, and you talked about the... Uh, the solar charge controller. Okay. And then, um, so the power is coming from the sun through the solar panels into the solar charge controller. Solar charge controller uh, will charge the batteries. All deep cycle batteries need three stage of charging. So that will do that automatically. There's, it's all computer controlled. The other thing that the solar charge controller does is prevent the batteries from getting overcharged. One of the worst things you do to a deep cycle battery is overcharge it. It, it starts to water. gas. Yeah. Yep. So it will stop charging and go into a trickle charge once batteries are at full, at 100%. So if you have too much solar going into your small battery bank, it's not going to hurt the battery bank as long as you have a good charge controller preventing the battery bank from being overcharged. From there, the power goes into the deep cycle battery or battery bank, and then from the battery bank, it will go up to the inverter. An inverter takes, and that was all DC voltage. The inverter takes the DC voltage, turns it into AC voltage. And here in America, we do um, 60 hertz, 120 volts, or 115. So then you can just turn this on. The inverter starts up, changes it over to AC, and you can turn the load on. And there you go. And that essentially is an off-grid solar system functioning right now. Of course, we're indoors, so we can't have the sun shining on the panels to show you how many amps it's pulling and all that, but that's the basic components. Now, Pete, um, you know, thanks for this uh, uh, demonstration here, uh, but there's more to this um, little display than meets the eye. Can you tell us a little bit more about this, uh, which you referred to as the robot? The robot is a box we put together, and we put it on an electric powered wheelchair. Just like you see folks driving around, disabled folks have that powered wheelchair. So that has batteries in it, 12-volt uh, DC, just like any electric wheelchair. And those batteries get charged off from our off-grid solar system. We put it out in the parking lot every day. We charge up this little battery in here and then whenever we need to charge the electric wheelchair we turn the inverter on, we take our power cord, we plug it into the inverter, plug it into the wheelchair and now we just use the sun to charge up the wheelchair. So <laughs> both the uh, wheelchair and the rest of this uh, display is all powered by solar. 100% yes. So the other uh, thing I asked you about was the fans and you have a uh, little tank and a pump on this end. Um, can you give me the big picture with uh, what's going on with that? You bet. What is, uh, we use this to, we'll go to shows and stuff like that and of course it's hot and sunny out. So we have wired this little box right here with a variety of switches and these, those switches will direct the power from the solar panels down to the deep cycle battery or over to these attic fans. We also sell attic fans. So I can see here that you have a main switch which allows you to uh, divert 
the power from the panels to the battery or to the fans? That That's correct. Right. Yep. Okay. And then the other switch is um, you can run one fan or the other fan or both fans. Okay. And at these fans, I can't turn them on right now because they work directly from the solar panel. And the idea is to show people that these attic fans, to increase your ventilation in your attic, get rid of that hot air, can run directly off the solar panels. There is no need for a solar charge controller because you don't need batteries and the fans are DC, so you don't need an inverter. It's very simple. For an attic fan running off from solar, you just need a solar panel, a thermostat, a fuse, and the fan. And, and what it. size uh, panel is basically required for that size of fan? If we do one 50 watt panel on this fan, that's more than enough to run that uh, fan at full speed. 50 watt panel, what size is the one on display here? This one's a 50 watt panel, so you oh, got okay. two of them. You got two 50 watts here, okay. So what we do is we have basically 100 watts of solar, and if we turn one fan on, they can see a lot of air is being blown, you can feel it going, and then if I turn two fans on, it shows you how much power is going to be, or how much air is going to flow, um, the same as one 50 watt panel with one fan. And then you mentioned the, uh, the pump on the other side. Yeah. And what we did there is we filled that up with cold water and ice when we go out to the shows on a hot summer day. And that is a 12 volt pump, just like in an RV that keeps the uh, sink and everything powered up with water. And the, the uh, solar panels not only run the fan, they'll run the pump, and then the pump feeds water through this mister system and it blows out some nice cool humid air. So you have a solar powered cooler. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Basically with the, with the mister system. And, and of course you can uh, move this all by your uh, wheelchair base so you can drive the thing around also. Yes. And it's fun Very to play nice. with. Very nice. Another good thing about this is it allows me to change the angle of the solar panels, go like that, individually, and that allows me to show people um, the amps that are produced and put into the batteries change a lot based on if the panels are directly perpendicular to the sun or if they're facing away from the sun. And that's very critical. It's, it's a very dramatic um, demonstration if we move it up like this, the amperage harvest drops by about 30 or 40 percent. The other interesting thing on this one is when I do this put it directly into the sun, if I put my hand across like this on one panel, it'll drop the amperage down by 30 or 40 percent just with that. And that shows why it's so important to have direct sun with no shadows. No I, I, I've seen you do that out in the parking lot before. That's yeah, kind of interesting to see how much of an effect just the, the hand shadowing the, the yep. panel does. The other good demonstration with that is I direct the power into the fans and then do that and you can actually hear the fans reduce in speed. Right. Well, what about, uh, now my understanding is that, you know, and up here in, in a rural area like we are. We, we do have people that have off-grid systems. It's not, you know, um, too uncommon to hear people that are living off the grid. Mm -hmm. But probably in most of uh, California, at least, um, there's a lot of solar in the state, but most of it is grid tied. Yes. Can you can you kind of walk us through a grid tied system? Absolutely. The big difference with uh, between grid tie and off grid is off grid uh, you have no power from the grid, no, um, no bill from the power company. But you have to have batteries because the panels only harvest the power uh, when the sun is out. So the sun goes down, you still need power to your refrigerator and everything else. That has to come from the batteries. With a grid tie system, you don't have any batteries. Therefore, you don't need a solar charge controller. It just goes directly into um, an inverter and then into the grid to run your meter backwards. And therefore, it's a much more simple and inexpensive system. Off-grid is more complicated and more expensive.
is more expensive because you've got the cost of the batteries and the, um, the uh, solar charge solar controller. charge control and so forth. Um, whereas the grid tie has fewer components, yeah. but I imagine it has some components that the uh, uh, that this one, the, the standalone, doesn't have. That's correct. They have uh, some safety features. Uh, so we can go over, uh, pan over to the grid tie inverter. Okay, I'm going to come in a little closer on it. Okay, Pete. So this is a grid tie. This is actually a hybrid inverter, but the grid tie inverter looks the same. A grid tie inverter is designed to take power from the solar panels. The power goes directly into um, some switching boxes and stuff for safety uh, with breakers and all that kind of thing. And then goes into the inverter. Remember the solar panels produce DC voltage, so we have to have an inverter that takes a DC power, inverts it into AC. And since it's going into the grid, it's going to be still the 60 hertz, but it'll probably be 240 volts just like the power coming into your house is 240 volts AC. Now, uh, hybrid, I see the label at the bottom there, it says hybrid inverter charger. So I take it by hybrid, you know, uh, we're used to mainly a car show, yes. and so we're not a hybrid vehicle is a little bit different than a hybrid uh, controller that you're talking about here. And I take it that that is, that this system is both grid tied and battery connected. Yes, exactly. Now, you know, that doesn't sound like uh, something I've heard much about. When is the case for that and, and you know, what? Yep, that's an excellent question there. Um, with the hybrid, that means that uh, the inverter can take power from the solar panels and put it into the grid, thus um, running your meter backwards. It can also, one of the negative things about the normal grid tie system is that um, when the grid goes down for whatever reason, if the power is no longer coming from the power company, your inverter and the solar panels will all shut down. It will, your house will be in the dark and you will not be running your meter backwards. So I have a solar set up on my house, let's say. It's a grid tie system and you know, the local utility uh, has an outage for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. And so here I am with solar on my house. I'm, I've got the ability to produce power, but I've got no power. That's Can you explain to us why that is? The main reason for that is safety. If uh, the grid goes down, they send a technician out to go repair the grid. Whatever the problem is, he's out there working on the power lines. They shut the power off before they start working on it. If your solar system is producing power and putting it back into the grid, you could electrocute the repairman, and that's a bad thing. So, that kind of ties us into the rest of this hybrid setup. So I would take it that if you live in a location where the utility service is not real reliable, say you live in the mountains, and you don't want to have um, a standalone, uh, you know, system. You want to be able to to have the uh, grid tie, but ten or twenty percent of the time, you know, especially during the winter and so forth, mm -hmm. uh, you're without power from the utility. I take it that's when this hybrid system is is of an ad, you know advantageous in that yep. grids down. This thing automatically switches over puts you on battery power. Exactly. Right? Okay. Yep, exactly. And the reason it's saying a uh, hybrid inverter charger is because when everything is working fine, the grid is up, solar panels producing power, meters running backwards, some of that power is being sent over to a battery bank. The battery bank is never used until the grid goes down. But it's maintained, its charge is maintained, it's maintained the rest of the time so that it's always at the ready. Right. The batteries are always at 100% ready to go. So in that scenario, the grid goes down, this automatically switches to battery power. You can 
So in that scenario, when the grid goes down, this automatically switches over to battery power. It does it so quickly, you may see lights flickering and that's it. You know that everybody else is in the dark and you're not. And the reason it says inverter charger, it's keeping those batteries up to 100%. You can also put in other sources of power uh, to recharge those batteries. For instance, if you had a generator. Uh, so if you're in the winter and the grid goes down and the sun isn't shining and uh, you need power, you can start the generator. That generator power will go into this hybrid inverter, charge batteries, run so, the load. But typically happy. you would run off the batteries until it became to a certain level and the weather forecast is <laughs> not looking good. Exactly. Then you would break out the generator. You, yes. The batteries buy you time, but there would be a point in, in, in certain scenarios where you would need additional backup power. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. And again, that would be based on the size of your your pack, yep. uh, your, your your reserve battery supply, as well as the conditions. If you're yes. in, you and know, how much load you're using. Yeah, exactly. Obviously, when you're running off of batteries, you can't be having three teenagers with hair dryers going while <laughs> the two adults are in the hot tub having a good time and all this. Not a good idea because you're wasting way too much electricity. That situation is a survival situation. Yeah. And that's how that works. In that situation, you better have a big generator even. <laughs> Absolutely. Yep. Uh, is there anything else about the solar that uh, you want to share with us, Pete? For the solar, that's about it. There are a lot of uh, little components, but um, this is an overview, so that's that. Yeah. And we also in the store here have, um, we can produce electricity with wind or hydro. Well, why don't you, uh, that's probably the, the, the next most popular would be uh, wind generation. Mm -hmm. And of course, everybody's familiar with the big, uh, you know, uh, industrial uh, windmills in, in certain parts of the country. Mm -hmm. um, but why don't you show us what is uh, compatible with a, right. with a private residence? We have two different styles of wind turbines. The style here is called a vertical axis and that's because the axle is vertical. And this style um, is really pretty cool looking. The big advantage of this one is that it can handle the gusty swirling winds a lot better than the propeller style. The propeller style wind turbine is called horizontal axis. And they are less expensive to build and therefore less expensive to purchase. And they're more efficient. So you would not want one of these unless you have a situation where you have a lot of wind and it's gusting and it's swirling and, and that sort of thing. I've seen uh, people that uh, live kind of on uh, the side of a ridge, you know, a little exactly. canyon type of situation and I've seen these, uh, some of our customers with the electric vehicles. Mm -hmm. um, and what's the um, is there a comparative between the two as far as uh, potential, I mean, so the case for one or the other depends on the type of wind source that exactly. you have, of course. Yes. Mm -hmm. But all things being equal, is there a difference in generation uh, capability? Yeah, the efficiency of it, um, the horizontal axis, the, the propeller style, will be a little bit more efficient as far as um, generating power from the same amount of wind. And a lot, it almost all has to do with the amount of surface area you have, wing surface area you have, uh, that's being struck by the wind. And all wind turbines are rated at their power output at a certain wind speed. Our turbines are rated at about 20 miles an hour. And they will produce however much power, whether it's 500 watts, a 2,000 watt wind turbine, 5,000 watt wind turbine. That's the amount of power they produce at a given speed of wind. As the wind slows down, it produces less power. Most people, for a residential situation, if you want wind and you compare it to solar here in Northern California, um, you will not choose wind because the cost of putting up the wind turbine for the amount of power produced for the year, solar winds. And that's here in the, the sunny Northern California area. Yeah, That would I, be different from I, different parts of the country. Yeah, I know overall, um, seems like I read that 
um, wind is 30% has, has, has a 30% greater output overall. In other words, there's a maximum amount of time that you're going to have sunshine. There's a, a certain amount of efficiency to your panels, so forth, mm -hmm. where wind is basically 24-7. Uh, so, it, given in you know the right locations, and everything wind would win out. Exactly. In, in the yes. big picture, yes. but uh, like you said, in an area like this where we're typically don't have much wind, uh, mm -hmm. certain times of year we'll get a little bit, but we right. don't have a constant wind like you do maybe at the coast or something. But we do have a lot of sunshine. We have a lot of sunshine year round. I mean, we've this in February now have been experiencing a, a lot of Nice warm, you know, 70s weather. <laughs> Very and few rainstorms. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. If, if we lived out on the coast, it would be a completely different story. Okay. If we lived out in the mountains, different story. Now, uh, we talked about the solar panels producing direct current. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the uh, output on a, a wind turbine? The, our wind turbines put out three phase AC. And they go into a controller that's designed to change it into DC power. And then from the DC power, it is inverted back to grid tie AC or it is used to charge batteries. And the grid tie AC would be for a grid tie system, charging batteries would be for an off grid system. Okay, now just hearing you say that, the first thing that came to my mind was an efficiency factor. Yep. So we, we were producing three-phase AC, and we're converting it to DC, uh -huh. and then we're inverting it back to AC. Yes. It sounds Boy. crazy. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds crazy. Why couldn't we just produce DC yes. uh, from the get-go and then invert it one time, have one you know, transformation there? Yep. Uh, produce, I don't know all the details on it, but producing DC power with a generator is less efficient than producing AC or um, something to that effect. Is it because uh, the load that a DC generator puts on the wind turbine in order to, you know, I, I people don't, don't know. you know, a lot of people don't realize, you know, but uh, the alternator on your car or the generator in your car, uh, you know, of course, depending on the load, of course, but mm -hmm. uh, if you have a, a substantial load, they require quite a bit of horsepower yes, to turn that thing over. Yes, One of the most common questions we get with the cars is, why can't you just turn an alternator while you're driving down the road? Mm -hmm. You know, you get, you've got the wheels going and axles going, why don't you just put a belt on there and, and turn an alternator and generate some power? So you have to, I always have to try to explain to people yes. that you can't do that because the load of the alternator or generator mm -hmm. is greater, it takes more energy to turn that generator than, than the energy you get out of the generator. Exactly. So the yeah. net result is a loss. Yes. So why bother? Exactly. You know, and so... Yes. Um, Another thing where it's related to the cars is the, your alternator in your car to charge your battery and keep your 12 volt lights working and all that, it's producing AC and that is correct. converted down to AC. Right, right. It, or it, DC, I'm sorry. It's yeah. producing AC and it's converted to DC. Yeah. And exactly why that is, I don't know, but it's been like that for many years, so it must be more efficient. Yeah, well, I, I think it, what, what uh, I don't know about the efficiency per se, it, it, it probably is. I do know that at lower RPMs, you get more output with the alternator than you do with the, the generator. Mm -hmm. If you're familiar with the older cars, when they all had yes. generators, at an idle, the lights would kind of dim down because <laughs> exactly. the generator, yep. the alternator, you didn't have that problem. It put out more power at a lower RPM. Right. Um, and that goes right into wind also because the with the three phase AC um, or any wind generation as the speed goes down your power goes down well if you're trying to take that variable power and send it back into the grid to run your meter backwards the grid has to see a certain voltage say 250 and a certain um, uh, phase which is 60 Hertz well, you can't have wind power producing constant power. It's producing whatever it's producing based on the speed of the wind. With the uh, power going up and down, up and down, volts and amps, 
you bring it into a DC voltage from the uh, AC production, and that's easier to keep it a more consistent input. Kind of smooths part. things out. Yes, it does. Yep. All and right. That's, so that's what's going on there. Very interesting. Well, I understand you also do hydro. We have available the Power Spout. Uh, that's the brand name. They're made in Australia um, or New Zealand. And uh, the name of the company is Power Spout, and you can go to powerspout.com and see their products. It's a great website. And this is designed where power or water from a creek or some kind of source like that falls down a certain number of feet. Uh, so the gravity is pulling the water, and that's where the energy comes from the water. So the water comes into this port, and it goes into this port and it spins this Pelton wheel. I was going to say, it's just a little miniature Pelton wheel. That's exactly what it is. So this is inside there, so with the water coming in here, in here, it goes in, spins the Pelton wheel, and then just splashes down into your creek. Just discharges out the bottom. Yep. And this is by far dollar for power, a watt of power produced, this is the best because it's producing power 24 hours a day. Solar panels are only producing the power a, a few hours a day when the sun is out. Wind is only producing it when it's windy. This is constant. So if you're getting 500 watts... Well, out the, of, the other constant too, not just time-wise, but yes. output-wise would be constant also. Yes, much easier to handle a constant source of power than a, a variable source of power. Mm -hmm. That's very true. So if you're getting 500 watts out of a Pelton wheel, that is so far superior for the day than 1,000 watts of solar because you multiply it by 24 hours instead of whatever your peak right. sun hours are. Now, what type of um, output, I mean, you know, well, let me ask this differently. What type of uh, source, you know, water volume mm -hmm. would be required to run a Pelton wheel this size. This has got two two-inch uh, inputs. Right. Um, how much volume of water are we talking about to run this thing? You know, the volume, twenty-four hours. Yeah, the volume would be um, significant. Uh, you're going to need like thirty, forty gallons a minute flowing. But more important than that, for this style of um, hydro turbine, is you need the feet of head. Mm -hmm. And this one. That's needs what creates the pressure. The Exactly. You have, you have volume and pressure. Volume and pressure, yes. So this one needs at least 20 feet of head. The water has to fall at least 20 feet mm -hmm. before it will spin this efficiently. Now if you were to look at this, this is a generator that's inside it, it spins easily. Just like the wind turbines spin easily. As soon as you put a load to it, it's very difficult to spin. Just And then I think that's the part, you know, that I mentioned earlier about people saying, you know, why don't you add the the alternator to the to the car, mm -hmm. they don't understand that load factor. Exactly. In that when that is producing electricity, it puts a load on that armature. Yes. You know, and that then takes some horsepower to turn, whether it be in turned by the wind or the water, you know, water, whatever, whatever it, it's gonna it take power to do that. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so you said 40 gallons. You would you would need minute. 40 gallons a minute. That's a lot of water, that's quite and that's good. minimal. Yeah. There are other uh, turbines, including Power Spout. They have ones that are designed for low feet of head. So if you only have 10 feet of head, the water is falling only 10 feet, uh, but you have huge amounts of volume. You use a different model, and it will produce not as much, but it will produce quite well. All right. Well, that's very interesting. Uh, you know, I've been here before and, and, and have seen uh, some of the batteries you have. Do you have any batteries on display today that we can we see what, what, what one of these, uh, uh, now I forget the term for non-tide, <laughs> what was it? You've got yeah, grid tide. Off-grid systems. And yes. off-grid. Yes. Um, can we take a look at what uh, what what an off-grid battery bank would look like? Sure. All right. We can. Well, Pete, I want to thank you for sharing today, and I kind of like to wrap up with talking about batteries. Um, 
one thing that electric cars have in common is that they all require you know batteries to, to move. Yep. No batteries, no, no go. Yeah. <laughs> so, and interesting thing in these systems that we talked about, with the exception of the uh, the grid tied system, mm -hmm. but the hybrid system, the uh, off grid, the uh, wind, mm -hmm. uh, they all use a battery bank as we use in a car. We use a, a bank of batteries to propel the car. And they typically are uh, 100 amp hour to 200 amp hour uh, lithium cells. But what you guys use in the uh, solar and wind is industry is a little bit different. Uh, do you, I mean, does anybody use uh, uh, lithium cells? Are they no, being used yet? I have never heard of them being used. They're just too expensive right now. And I would imagine the charging parameters are less forgiving. Uh, with the lead acid, they're pretty forgiving. If you overcharge or undercharge, they'll recover. Um, but there are some disadvantages to them. Uh, the lead acid, of course, very, uh, very heavy. And you have to check the water. And uh, they can only handle a 50% discharge. If you go past 50%, uh, you hurt the batteries pretty bad, and the lifespan of the batteries decreases dramatically. I know the lead acid that we used in the, the old days, uh, yep. you know, half a dozen years ago or so, uh, of electric vehicles. Uh, you know, we used a good uh, traction battery, mm -hmm. uh, uh, lead acid uh, flooded cell, three to four hundred life cycles. What type of life cycles are we talking? The same, same type of, I mean, they're the same chemistry. They're a lead acid battery. Yep, and they'll go longer than that. Uh, actual life cycles is probably twice that. Okay, and that's probably due to the fact, because I know one of the, the two uh, greatest uh, factors in determining the life cycles of a lead acid battery, as well as most chemistries, is the depth of discharge yes. and the rate of discharge. Absolutely. And so you're both. controlling both of those. Yes. Yeah. The rate of discharge is going to be, if everything is correct, it's going to be quite slow. Much and less than what you would have in a car. Yes. Where you're yes. you're pulling out, uh, you know, possibly you know a thousand amps. Yeah. The lead acid uh, batteries used in the vehicles, uh, you only got three or four hundred uh, cycles. And of course, you know, one downside about lead acid is once you do that, they're toast, they're gone. Exactly. The end of the life is uh, they can't recover very quickly. And the depth of discharge, with these large batteries, you can get probably twice that many life cycles out of them. But it can only go about 50% depth of discharge. With the lithium batteries for the cars, what's your depth of discharge? Well, with the lithium, the maximum would be 80%. And that's most of them are rated life cycles at 80 percent depth of discharge. Right. And again, most of the chemistries, if you only discharge at 50 percent, it really increases. And with most lithium chemistries, it's one and a half to two times the life cycles if you only go to 50 percent. That's very similar to the lead acid that we have. Only instead of 80 percent, you can't go past 50 percent. And if you only discharge 20 percent, then you can get one and a half to two times the life out of them. And with lithium, if you only do 20 percent, they're basically lifetime. Yep. I mean, just they'll, they'll go forever. Mm -hmm. The other beauty of a, a lithium cell, and that's why they're, you know, uh, the choice for automotive purposes, other than the energy density, is that even if you do the number of life cycles, and say it's 3,000 life cycles of 80 percent depth discharge, once that has been achieved, the batteries aren't toast like they are with lead acid. Well, you still will have 80 percent of the original capacity. Wow. So if you had a 100 amp per hour cell, now you have an 80 amp per hour cell. So they're not, you know, throwaways at that point. Right. You're just going to have reduced range. Uh, so. Tell me a little bit, you know, more specifics about these that we're showing. These are these are typical what we would find yes. in a um, off-grid setup. Yes, off-grid or uh, the grid-type hybrid, but this is the most common size for the residential uh, solar systems, and the size is called L16, 
Uh, some people are familiar with ones that are about the same footprint but half the height, and those are golf cart batteries. And those are a lot less expensive, but they will last less time. Mm -hmm. The pipes and are smaller, and so they're just not going to have a lot. Smaller, line. they're less. These are more massive inside. They're very heavy. You know, a lot of acid. Would you say lead. these are about 100 pounds a piece? About 120 pounds a piece. 120 pounds a piece. Yes. So those boys are some big boys. Yeah. When you're lifting these things up, you really have to uh, be prepared for it. Okay. And of course, they're filled with lead, which or filled with acid, which is. You know, the fumes come out and the whole bit, they're, they're kind of dangerous. You have to have ventilation. You have to now be I careful know, with them. In our, uh, our marketing vehicle, Bob, he's got uh, the lead acid traction batteries. Mm -hmm. And they're a pretty good size uh, battery, uh, 66 pounds a piece. So about half of this. Yep. And they're 130 ampere hour cells. Right. Uh, what, what do we have here? These are special, um, they're RE rated batteries, which is renewable energy. There's some internal structures in there that increase the life and the efficiency. These have over 400 amp hours, and these are 6 volt batteries. So if you were to put these four together in a 12 volt system, you would have over 800 amp hours of power at 12 volts. Mm -hmm. Just out of four batteries. This look, the XC looks familiar, that's an American battery? Yes. Yeah. yeah. U.S. Yeah. batteries made in America. Yeah. 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 U.S. battery. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I used to get our U.S. batteries from a place called American Battery in Hayward, California. That's uh, so where you go. That's where I got the American. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we we switched from the Trojans to the U.S. battery. Mm -hmm. Much better 12 volt cell. Right. Uh, Trojan still makes a great 6 volt, but we had problems with the 12 volts. Oh. Um, yeah. well, They're pretty interesting. Just high maintenance, heavy. But they're kind of the. Uh, this is a standard. This is yep. kind of the standard in the industry today still. Yep. For residential solar, renewable energy, um, the only reason you would go with golf carts, the smaller or shorter ones, is lack of space. Um, if you have the height, like an RV, you can't get the L16s in there. You go with golf cart batteries. Yeah. Well, these, yeah, like you said, typically in a residential, you probably got the height. The, the, the footprint otherwise looks about the same. Yes. Yes, it is. Well, I... Appreciate your time and, and sharing with us. How about I give you a hand and put the it. batteries away? Please do. All right.